Thank you, James. Don't you wish you had that much energy to go on to be a, do a lock-in all night long? I remember it. It was great fun. John, remember, we brought our stereos from home. Our big home stereos, you know, back in the day. You had your receiver, your amp, your tape deck. Your, I mean, yeah, because we didn't have C Well, we did have CDs then, but anyway. We brought our speakers, and we wired them in. And that was before. I'm not that old. Not quite. But anyway. I had a question. Did he say that Mavis did the slip and slide? <laughs> Wings were all over the place. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, let's rise together and let's focus our hearts and our minds. The Lord gave us snow, so it's pretty easy to sing Christmas songs this morning, isn't it? Yeah. He gave us 12 inches on for December 12th. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echo back their joyous rings. Bye. 
Would you pray with me this morning? Oh God, we have come before you to worship you, to adore you, to give glory to the, your name and to lift high the name of Jesus. There is no name like your name. For at your name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we realize that we worship you in spirit and in truth and you have made known to us the, 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 uh, not only the uh, complexity of the Christmas story and how it all came about and how it all unfolded, but just the intricacies of it and how you led and ordained the whole thing. And we are not only fascinated by it, but we realize that not only do you bring together all things through the babe at Christmas, through our Savior. But you also tie together and you make things happen in our lives because we are walking with you, we are following you, we are being obedient to you. Today, may that be the case for us, even as we apply our hearts in worship, adoration, prayer, and opening your word. We do pray today for individuals, families, communities that have been devastated by the tornadoes that happened in Kentucky and Arkansas and Illinois and maybe other places that we're not aware of. Oh, that you would meet them in this time and show them how you're going to care for them. And I'm sure that you are already bringing people around them to, to assist in every way. And we pray that your hand would be evident in it all and that someday they can look back and see that this was not just a catastrophe, this was something that you were able to bring good out of bad things. Most of all today, our God, we pray that you would just open our eyes to your truth. That we would be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit speaks into our lives. Whether it's in music spoken word or just the sense of you speaking to us in in quiet moments that we would be receptive that we would be listening and that we would be fully engaged in our time together this morning we pray it in Christ's name Amen. we continue to sing about Jesus our Savior and, and our Redeemer. Let the words uh, that you're singing, uh, think about them. Let them impact you And uh, as you worship. There is a truth older than the angels. There is a promise of things yet to come.
the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, even in Storden. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. Infant one who is the true light who gives light to everyone was going to come into the world but although the world was made through him the world didn't recognize him when he came even in his own land and among his own people he was not accepted but to all who believed him and accepted him he gave the right to become children of God they are reborn. This is not a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. This rebirth comes from God. So the Word became human and lived here on earth among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. has come for us, this Jesus, he's the hope for all mankind, he has come for us, the Messiah, born to give us life, from God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same. Son of God by name, oh, oh tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh tidings of comfort and joy. He has come for us, this Jesus, he's the hope for all mankind. He has come for us, the Messiah, or to Jesus 
of this season, Lord. Our world tends to forget you and forget the true meaning of Christmas. But, oh Lord, may we not do that. I pray that you would just continue to speak it into each one of our hearts this season. Speak it into our lives, Lord. Help us to truly meditate and ponder and worship you because of what you've done, that you sent the message of hope and salvation through the birth of that child. And Jesus, thank you that you were faithful and that you lived that life and you walked that road and that you went to the cross for that reconciliation of mankind's sin. But Lord, may we not take it lightly. May we remember the reason for the season. And may it cause in us a, a humble heart of worship and adoration to you. The Christ child, the babe that was born to save the world. We gather in honor of your name, Jesus. We gather to remember, reflect, and to exalt you. And we love you. We pray it all in your name, Jesus. In your name, amen. Here are the words from James chapter 3 from the message. You don't need to turn there, but just ask that you would listen. For it sets really the framework for what uh, we're going to see today. James chapter 3. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it, smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't, can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. Recently, Chris and I were playing the song that is sung by Simon and Garfunkel entitled The Sound of Silence. Later on, I, I got to thinking, wouldn't it be great if there was actually a button for your mouth? You know? The ministry of the button of silence. The ultimate app. We have apps for everything else. Wouldn't it be great if there was an app that could shut your mouth? 
You ever feel like you need a button for your mouth? Or maybe for the mouth of the person sitting next to you? We often associate this season of the year with more noise. Whether that be TV specials, or whether that be parties, or whether that be busyness that we go about getting things done, or whether that be shopping at the malls. And yet, the very first Christmas present was a kind of gift of silence. So let me show you this story. We read in Luke chapter 1 about an old man named Zechariah who was a priest. One day he's in the temple serving. And an angel named Gabriel showed up and said that old Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth would have a son. And they were supposed to name him John. He would become John the Baptist and he would help prepare Israel for what God was about to do through Jesus, through the coming of of a Messiah. So as we look at the text in Luke 1 verse 18, if you have a Bible or device to look at it, we see what Zechariah asked the angel at that point in time. Luke 1 verse 18. He says, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Wasn't that a kind way for how he talked about his wife's age? Calls himself an old man and she's well along in years. So Zechariah essentially said to the angel, no, it's not possible. It couldn't happen. God could not do this. I'm too old. And Elizabeth, my wife, is also too old. So, Angel, you have the wrong guy. But actually, it is possible. When we look at verse 19 of Luke 1, it says, The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. So Zechariah, why should you be so quick to say what God can do and what God cannot do? So Zechariah, you need a button for your mouth. Look at verse 20. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. So God is going to present to Zechariah in silence in a way that God could not break through to Zechariah in words. This is the strange gift of silence. And I believe there are some aspects to Zechariah's silence that we should look at today as we think about silence in our lives as followers of Christ. So, first, Zechariah can't say anything. It says in verse 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So imagine trying to tell people that you've just seen an angel using only your hands. It's like Zachariah, 
all of a sudden he's playing the game of charades. You know, it's. And then there's this other dimension of silence. Nine months later, for after the son is born, Zachariah's friends and neighbors gather together. And here's what it says later in chapter 1, verse 62, when we go further in the chapter. Then they made signs to his father, that is Zechariah, to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. If they're making signs to communicate to Zechariah, that means not only can he not speak, but he can't hear. This is silence for Zechariah. So I want to consider how we can practice silence during this Christmas season by kind of entering into Zechariah's experience for the next few moments. So you ready to do that? Imagine your life with no television, no internet, no radio, no movies, no iTunes, no cell phones, no newspapers, magazines, anything like that. And if you think about it, that was closer to life in earlier days when they were alone with their minds way more than we are. That actually meant their ability to focus their attention was much stronger than it is for us today. And for Zechariah now, there is not even conversation. There's no local gossip. There's not who's doing what, who's getting ahead, who's falling behind, who has what, who should I envy, who should I pass judgment on. There was none of that. So let me ask you, what do you think about when you have no external source of stimulation to distract your attention or guide your thoughts. What do you think about them? What do you think about when you're left only with your mind and your heart and soul? We actually don't like that, do we? We don't like that. This is quite ironic. We complain a lot about noise and sound in our world, but silence actually makes us much more uncomfortable. We don't like it because silence leaves us vulnerable to what is actually in our minds and the human mind on its own drifts toward things like anxiety and boredom and sometimes even anger. That's the human mind on its own, unaided. We run from silence. I think of the number of times that I'll come home from working and I have to turn something on. A lot of times it's music. Sometimes it's the television. Not too many people use their radios anymore except in their cars. But we turn something on. We don't like silence. We don't like it, but Zechariah can't get away from it. 
<laughs> he's alone with his thoughts. This is ironic and tragic. I mean, we live in a world that allows us to never be alone in any kind of profound or deep way with our thoughts. Because in silence, you and I are at the mercy of whatever we've been filling our minds with. And that is why wise people understand how important it is to be intentional about what they fill their minds with. But perhaps in silence, Zachariah's mind turned toward the word of God. Perhaps. Maybe he thought about Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Or maybe it was the text from Habakkuk 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. But have no doubt, in silence, the reality of God becomes clear to Zechariah. You, you see, our minds can get so cluttered. And our souls can get so thin and so tired and so superficial just from the sheer stupid clamor of all the noise we subject ourselves to. You see, the invitation this Advent season is not to do more. Maybe it's to do less. Maybe it's to go someplace where you can be alone a place where there's no sound except maybe the sounds of na nature. So maybe it's to the beach. Now I realize there's no beach around here open this time of year. But it's a nice place to go. Or maybe it's to the woods. Or maybe it's to the mountains. Maybe it's for one hour or two hours. Maybe a half a day. Whatever you think you can take and be still. So this is what I think will happen for most of us if we attempt to do that. At first you won't like it. And your mind will be filled with anxieties and thoughts of all that you have to do. Or you might be bored or you might dwell in fear. But if you will make some time to be alone, then you can talk to God about what's actually on your mind. Be still and know that I am God. Here's the other part of, about Zachariah's silence. He's not hearing noises and sounds but he can't speak either, right? What this means is that for nine months, Zechariah can't say all the things that he would normally say to control the people and the opinions and the lives of others around him. So being silent is an act of humility. There's an interesting thing to watch in families and workplaces, and that is the patterns of speech. Typically, whoever has the most power will be the person who talks the most or talks more. It's part of what we use power to do. Being silent is an act of humility. For our words reflect our heart. And our verbal patterns are so deeply ingrained that we cannot control them just by trying hard. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 34. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, the goal isn't just to manage your mouth. 
The goal is to have a transformed heart that is ruled by God's holiness. John Ortberg tells the story of when he and Nancy got married. It was a big wedding and there were a lot of gifts. A few months after their own wedding, their friends named Rick and Barb got married and so the Ortbergs gave them a wedding gift. When Rick and Barb opened it, they found a lovely pair of candlesticks that said, Congratulations to John and Nancy. John and Nancy Ortberg. In other words, somebody had given those candlesticks to the Ortbergs and they re-gifted them to Rick and Barb. You all know about re-gifting, right? Don't look at me like I'm the only one who's ever done this. Anyway, the Ortbergs had re-gifted, but they never took the note off. John Ortberg goes on to say that Rick and Barb never complained. They never said a word about it. <laughs> they just gave those candlesticks to another young couple who got married. True story. But Rick and Barb were wise enough to put a new note on the candlesticks. There is a wonderful statement in the book of Proverbs with wisdom about the human condition. It's found in Proverbs 25, verse 11. It says, A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Do you realize it is of incalculable value when the right word is spoken at the right time? from the right person in the right way. And of course, the wrong word is of incalculable damage. But one of the practices God can use to retrain us is to speak redemptively in silence. Often in his ministry, Jesus goes into places where he can be silent. He can be solitary, time alone. In fact, in the first chapter of Mark, at the beginning of his ministry, very early in the morning, it says while it was still dark, he withdrew to a solitary, silent place. And then later on, before Jesus is going to choose his disciples, he withdraws into silence again. And even after he feeds the 5,000, he withdraws into silence again. There's a pattern that we see in his life and ministry. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Again, we live in an even live in an even noisier world than Jesus did. I mean, if Jesus, who lived in a much less noisy world, needed to practice silence, there's a good chance that you and I need a little boost of it now and then. How do we do this when we live in the real world, have jobs and all that sort of thing? Well, we have to be intentional about this. So just three things that I kind of have just imagined and I hope that you can come up with other ways where you can be intentional in this way. One, you might take a portion of a day as a time when you don't speak. <laughs> or you take a day when you just try the discipline of not complaining. Have you ever taken a whole day when you try not to complain? But maybe a portion of a day when you choose not to speak, you choose to be silent with your thoughts. 
and apart from all the noise. Secondly, do you ever listen during the day to what you've said, and then after you said it, you ask yourself, is that the kind of thing that God would want me to say? Sometimes, you know, we're very quick to respond, and we think about it later, and we realize it maybe wasn't the most God-honoring statement we could make. And then maybe, maybe, you want to take a fast from the media with no TV, no internet, no cell phone. It's, it's a way to eliminate noise and distraction from your world. You say, impossible. On a regular, everyday basis, probably, but not for a, whatever amount of time you think is doable. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. The point of practicing silent, silence is not to practice silence. People get all goofed up about spiritual practices sometimes. I mean, I don't have to prove how spiritual I am by how long I can go in silence or something like that. I mean, you can be a very nonverbal person and still have a messed up heart or a dark and an ungrateful heart. It reminds me of a story about a, a monk who joined a monastery. And this was a real strict monastery where the head guy, the abbot, tells them, now that you've joined here, you have to take a vow of silence. You're only allowed to say two words every 10 years. So a whole decade and only two words. So a guy is there for 10 years in dead silence. He meets with the abbot who says to him, after a decade, do you have anything to say? The guy says, food bad. Ten more years go by, and he meets with the abbot again. Do you have anything to say? Bad heart. Ten more years go by, and the abbot meets with him again. Do you have anything else to say? I quit. The abbot says, well, I'm not surprised. You've done nothing, done nothing but complain since you got here. You see, the point is not how silent can I be? That's not the point. The point is, through silence, can God speak to me in some unique ways? And can I be freed up from those habitual patterns of even saying stuff that is destructive or deceitful or judgmental? or gossipy to other people. Basically, can I be freed up from my own evil heart? Can God speak to me in those times of silence? For nine months, Zechariah lives in silence. I'll guarantee you, if you spend nine months in silence, it's going to change you. God will use it. And in silence, God's word becomes real to Zechariah so that when the baby is finally born, his relatives and neighbors, you know, they want him to name the baby Zechariah after his dad. What happens? Instead, Zechariah gets a tablet and writes his name is John. 
In other words, now he believes and obeys from his heart. And then we're told in verse 64 of Luke chapter 1 that immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak praising God. May I ask you this morning, what would be the first thing out of your mouth? After nine months of not being able to speak? Well, you don't know because you've never done that, right? Neither have I. Would it be praise to God? How cool it would be if that would be true of all of us at this church fellowship, that our mouths could be opened and our tongues could be set free from the things like sin, free from deceit, free from the pettiness of life, free from gossip, free from judgmentalism, free from constant angling to try to get our own way and to just speak words of gratitude and praise and courage and truth and love. That would change us, change our families, and certainly would change our community. So the story of Jesus here in the Gospel of Luke begins with this strange silence. It's real odd, I know, talking about silence in our world. But the story of Jesus is marked all the way through by these moments of silence. Not only that, but the biblical account ends with silence. And if you've never read through what are called the passion narratives, that is the story about Jesus' death, that we're told about Jesus being silent at that time as well. One of those instances is when Jesus is before Pilate in Matthew 27, verse 14. It says, but Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. In the end, we're saved by those words that Jesus did not say And maybe in a way, Jesus was demonstrating for us all the words he could say, but he doesn't. Those words of judgment, those words of condemnation and guilt that I deserve. And God does not even say it, though it killed his son. Maybe we are saved as much by the silence of God as we are by the word of God. So I would like to just end this message in our worship time, not with all kinds of words, but with the gift God gave to Zechariah. So I just ask that you bow your heads right now and just pray with me. And I'm going to give you some time to just have quiet time with the Lord by one and then we'll wrap it up this morning. So Heavenly Father you know our world is filled with so much noise. We compete with so many voices and our minds get anxious and afraid. But right now God we still ourselves before you. Would you speak to us in these moments? So take this moment to be still before God, to listen, to know that he speaks to us even in silence.
God, we listen and we pray all of this in Jesus' name as we go from this place. As you have taught us through this example with Zechariah, teach us how to be silent as a way of preserving and protecting our soul. And especially as a way of listening to you. We pray it in our Savior's name.